One realizes very quickly we've been seeing this technology for decades. I had access to, to all those programs. no obvious signs of propulsion and yet this object is witnessed now by four separate individuals in two separate aircraft welcome back everybody to another live interview here on the disclosure team channel I'm really excited for this one. I've been speaking to Christian now for, for a few months behind the scenes, um, discussing, you know, what he's experienced, his anomalous sightings uh, and things like that. And he's finally decided to come forward and talk about it, which is uh, really good in this current climate. You know, we've had a lot of pilots come forward recently. Uh, so I'm just glad that we're seeing more and more. And I hope that videos and interviews like this only prompt more people to to come forward. Um, it's a safe place, and and we really highly respect what they uh, what they have to discuss. So yeah, to everyone in the live chat, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. If you do have any questions throughout the interview, please pop them in capital letters. It just helps me see them more clearly. Uh, we're going to be going through quite a few different cases and sightings that Christians had. So. You might have questions uh, pertaining to that particular case. I will do my best to, to see them and ask them as we're discussing that individual case. Um, my apologies in advance if I don't, but um, I've got lots to do. So, uh, yeah, keep the chat nice and uh, calm and collected and and positive and, you know, I, you always do. So I, I, I don't really need to say it these days. Well, let's waste any more. Uh, not Let's not waste any more time. Uh, my guest today is Christian Van Heist. He is a 747 cargo pilot with quite an extensive flying career, which we're going to go through as well. Uh, so, yeah, here he is. Please welcome Christian Van Heys. Christian, how are you doing? Good, good. How are you, Vinny? I'm really good. We're here finally. <laughs> yeah, thanks for inviting me. It's such an honor, and it's uh, it's really nice to uh, finally present a couple of cases I've been wondering about, pondering about for the last couple of years. So uh, really, really excited. Yeah, thank you so much. The, the honor's all mine. The pleasure's all mine. This is going to be a fantastic conversation. You know, like I said, the uh, we've been speaking now for quite a few months, um, and I understand that it's a sensitive topic for sort of commercial and private and civilian pilots to talk about. But at the same time, you know, through our discussions, I think you you said to me you understand the importance of of coming forward. So thank you so much for doing that. Well, yeah, you're more than welcome. And um, I must say, for me as a commercial pilot, there's not so much pressure. Um, actually, in that sense, it's kind of a good thing that I'm not a military pilot because I don't have to uh, um, adhere to any secrecy or any uh, any commanders. In that sense, I'm a yeah, I'm a commercial pilot, and if I see something, it's uh, it's uh, it's open for me to share it with the world. And uh, yeah, well, as, as we go through all these cases, uh, hopefully in the next hour or so uh we will see that um i think there's also a lot of possible explanations for some of the things that i've seen so i can talk openly about everything and anything and uh well let's let's try and, and get to the bottom of it at least a couple of them absolutely fantastic i can't wait but i think initially uh, i'd love to know a bit more about yourself uh you know about your career and and you know starting from a young age what what got you into the uh the love of aviation and flying if you can start wherever you like well, basically, the love for flying started when I was really young, when I was, uh, I think, four years old. I had my first flight as a passenger, and it's one of the first memories I had. It's just looking out of the window and enjoying all the views, and it was, it still is mesmerizing to see the clouds and to see the world from such a literally unique perspective from above the world. And uh, this triggered me, I think, subconsciously to um, to to be interested in, in in flying and aviation. And as soon as I could, I pursued a career in aviation. Uh, first, I studied for about two years uh, aeronautical engineering, but uh, I decided that instead of the drawing board, I wanted to fly the airplanes myself. <laughs> um, and actually, uh, I already started uh, taking flying lessons, glider lessons, when I was 14, and I got my first private pilot license when I was 17. So uh, I was really uh, motivated to uh, to be in the air and to uh, to fly. 
right? Um, and I've been really lucky so far. Uh, when I was 20, I uh, managed to get my first job as a pilot in aviation. Uh, pretty young, uh, I still had a lot of hair, but uh, <laughs> that's what aviation <laughs> does to you, I guess. Uh, no, but without kidding, I had a, uh, I was really lucky to get a job uh, with a company that is was basically uh, leasing out their airplanes, including crews, to other airlines. It was on a small airplane, a Fokker 50 turboprop, um, uh, which is um, relatively small, only only 50 seats, a short range uh, operation. For that company, I flew for a lot of European airlines. Uh, we flew a lot of passengers for, you name it, all the big uh, European airlines. But I also flew contracts in Africa for a lot of African companies, which was really adventurous. Uh, and we had a military contract or military contract in the Afghanistan, where I flew uh, for almost one and a half years, uh, doing military contract uh, flights, basically hired by the, the military. Um, and we just shipped all their people and equipment around. And that was really something really adventurous. It was uh, it was it was just just great, really, uh, really amazing. Um, but my ambition was uh, was to fly a bit bigger than just a, a turboprop. And um, fortunately, when I was, uh, what was it? Uh, 23 i was hired on the 737 with a european charter company dutch uh dutch airline and for four and a half five years i flew with boeing 737 all over europe which was a really interesting experience as well really good for my flying career because for as a pilot you want to have jet hours and uh, even though i uh, i really liked the job uh, my ambition was still to see the world and to uh, to fly around the world in a a bit bigger airplane so eventually i was hired uh, when i was 27 on the boeing 747 um, uh, as a, um, a cargo pilot and this was already i think 12 almost 13 years ago and since then i've been flying uh, all over the world in the boeing 747 and it's just uh, the best job ever it's really cool um yeah it's it's been fantastic and now since about uh, one year i'm uh, captain on the 747 I'm now 39 years old so uh, i'm i've been really lucky in that sense to uh, to, uh, to have a steep career in aviation still fly small uh, airplanes cessnas etc just uh, across the netherlands sometimes with friends and family so i'm i'm, I'm an aviation nerd <laughs> uh, but besides that, I'm interested in aerospace. I'm really interested in the Apollo missions, which is uh, which is a topic that is, uh, is triggering my imagination. Um, interested in history, just um, just basically everything that has to do with with ancient history to modern history in the First World War, Second World War. So um, yeah, that's uh, that's basically me. Um, and also a major part of my life is photography, and this is pretty much parallel with um, with the flying career. And it started almost literally from the first flight I told you about when I saw these views as a young boy from the from the cabin windows. I just I just felt the need to immortalize it, to capture it. Yeah. And ever since my first flights uh, during flight training, I always had a small camera with me, not taking too many pictures, but whenever there was a chance to to take pictures of some mountains or clouds, whatever. And especially when I flew in Africa and Afghanistan on the Fokker 50. Um, I realized that the stuff that I was seeing, the adventures I was experiencing, uh, were really, really unique. And I just had to document it, not just the views, which were already kind of uh, interesting, but just the adventures, all this stuff we did there and experienced. It, it had to be captured. And if I wouldn't do it, then nobody else would do it. So uh, I invested a little bit for as far as I could in the smaller camera. And um, this was basically, as I said, parallel with my flying career. Every time I upgraded an airplane, I was able to upgrade my photography equipment as well. So uh, <laughs> this, uh, um, flying the 747, that means we fly really long distances uh, generally uh, with a, a low workload during cruise flight, which allows me to take pictures uh, mostly from the cockpit. So I'm, I'm kind of specialized in aerial photography. And uh, it's a big passion together with flying that, that that's, uh, for me personally, it's just a great combination. And I'm, uh, I'm really enjoying that. So for me, the, the um, Flying is really a lot of fun, and I do it with a lot of passion, and I do it as a professional. And on top of that, capturing the beauty, capturing the uh, the unbelievable landscapes from above, and literally sharing that with the world through social media, and my website, etc. It's just two two things that uh, that blend together perfectly. And uh, yeah, so in a nutshell, that's uh, that's me. Um, yeah, maybe some viewers might have some questions uh, about the flying experience. Um, I've got a almost nine and a half thousand hours of flight experience right now of which just over six thousand on the 747 
which doesn't mean uh, too much, but it just shows that I'm not uh, just the first guy to, to take a flying lesson and uh, and proclaim to see uh, funny stuff from, from the air. I'm uh, I know what I'm I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I think, <laughs> and, um, yeah. So in a nutshell, that's uh, that's me. That's amazing. Thank you so much. It's such a romantic career flying around the world. It's yeah, I really envy you in some ways. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, I recommend everybody that's watching, listening, uh, if you go to the description below, you'll find all of Christian's social media links and his website. I highly recommend you go and check it out. There's some absolutely amazing uh, photography and stuff put on there. So please go and check that out. Right. So let's move on to the topic of UFOs. I'd just like to know, you mentioned there, you, you know, you have a, a passion for sort of history and things like that. When did the UFO subject first kind of uh, enter your life and, and to what level? Um, well, of course, I heard about the, the lore about UFOs and uh, and uh, um, the flying saucer myths uh, um, when I was very young because um, it's 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 part of our culture, but I never really took it serious. If I'm really honest, um, mm. it was too much of a um, of a fringe uh, topic. Uh, the uh, the big problem is that there was only a lot of anecdotal evidence. Um, I just I just couldn't take it too serious because I'm I, I consider myself an open-minded skeptic in the sense that I'm open-minded to a lot of topics I'm open-minded to uh, uh, philosophies etc. But I'm kind of skeptic and if I don't see it with my own eyes, um, that's that's I yeah I, I, don't, I don't know I cannot really be interested in those kind of topics. Um, um, having said that, I uh, saw the uh, interview with the commander David Fravor. Uh, for the viewers uh, who don't know who he is, he's an ex Top Gun um, Navy pilot, also F 18 pilot, and he's a very trustworthy guy. And he did a couple of interviews, including with Joe Rogan and also for the New York Times, I think. I saw his interviews, and this guy is the real deal. He's super steady, um, and he came forward with his observations about some objects he saw. And I think this was in 2017 when I, when I first saw his interview. And the first thing that came to mind was, hey, <laughs> I think I've seen some of these things as well. And I always thought they were military. But now one of these top military pilots, absolutely credible, is, is, is basically coming forward and saying that he has no clue what they were. Um, that initially opened up my, my eyes to the, uh, to the topic in the sense that I, I was still hesitant. Um, but I decided to read into it a little bit more i read all the articles uh from leslie keen i think it was in the new york times and yeah. um saw some other interviews with commander david fravor and i think in 2018 i saw the first interviews with uh, louis elizondo the head uh, the former head of uh, atip um and um I, I was absolutely blown away because basically this was confirming uh, the story uh, from Leslie Keane, it was uh, confirming the story of Commander David Fravor and his, his fellow pilots. And basically what uh, well, the conclusion that I drew is that uh, there was something really interesting going on here. And uh, some of the stuff I've seen in the past might actually not be that easily uh, uh, dismissible as, as something military or some kind of uh, rocket stuff. And actually, um, yeah, since 2018, I decided to read more and more about the topic and to basically um, try to identify the stuff that I've seen in the past, because I've seen quite a lot of things uh, from the air, uh, which 99% is, is easily explainable, or maybe even later explainable. We have one case, we'll, we'll cover it uh, later on, uh, that took me almost uh, maybe eight years to, 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 to find out what it was, but eventually I did find it out. So I was hoping by reading more about the topic to uh, basically come to an easy conclusion and to either dismiss it as a hoax or uh, uh, find some answers to the stuff I've seen. And uh, <laughs> it's been a rabbit hole because since since then, <laughs> um, basically, I, I've, I've, I found out that uh, this is a, a major topic for not just uh, the US Defense uh, uh, Department of Defense and a lot of um, Navy pilots, but for many more countries. I, I believe it's Brazil, Japan, in China even, they're admitting their uh, um, they're dealing with this phenomena uh, in France. Uh, there's, it, there's even the, I think it's, uh, the, I don't know, the task force. I think it's uh, part of uh, CNES, part of the, the French uh, Space Force that are taking this subject very serious. I believe even the, the Spanish army is taking it very serious. And for me, it's only confirming that uh, what I've seen is, is, is maybe more than just uh, uh, 
a military black budget uh, <laughs> rocket yeah. tour, whatever it is. So yeah, long story short, I became interested since um, um, since the interviews with Commander David Traver and uh, Louis Elizondo, and uh, yeah, now we're here. And I can only hope that uh, more pilots will come forward. Let's say more. Um, credible observers will come forward with their uh, sightings because uh, I know for a fact that uh, quite a lot of pilots have seen things. Uh, many of many many pilots still think it's something military, it's something mundane, and other pilots just simply literally don't want to know. They see something and they say, "I don't want to know." Um, so if this can be the the first uh, step towards more openness about the topic uh, among uh, pilots, civil pilots, credible observers, uh, the better. Yeah, I hope so too. Um, I've got a great question here from my friend Yorne, but before we do that, you mentioned Lou, Lou Elizondo there, and before we jumped on the live, I mentioned that I'd um, spoken to Lou earlier in the week about it, and that he'd, you know, he was really impressed uh, that you were coming forward. But one thing I didn't tell you is that I've actually got something. I've got a little message here for you <laughs> as well. So bear with me when I bring that up. So yeah, I'm going to play this. Hi, Christian. It's Lou Elizondo. I just want to take a brief moment here and thank you sincerely for everything that you're doing and coming forward and having this conversation. We all hear about the military pilots uh, regarding the UAP, but it's not very often that we get the strength and courage from a private pilot uh, to, to have this conversation. So I want to thank you very much for, for your courage coming forward. And hopefully one of these days uh, I can make it up to you and buy you a beer or, uh, or a cup of coffee. Thanks so much, Christian. Bye-bye. Wow. Wow. That made my day. That made my day. Wow. That's amazing. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. In, uh, oh, oh, wow. It's, it's, that's, that's unexpected. And that's, that's really cool. <laughs> I'm um, sorry. I sprang it on you. <laughs> <laughs> that was uh, kind of surprising, but um, I really hope that it's, uh, it doesn't feel like, um, um, uh, how do you say this? Like a, a huge step for commercial pilots to come forward. And uh, we've seen a lot in the last couple of months, um, that some, um, I think some Gulfstream pilots in the US over the Pacific, they came, yeah. they came forward with their sightings as well. So I really think that uh, also, also thanks to, to Mr. Elizondo's uh, uh, interviews and efforts, um, the topic is becoming um, less fringe and more, uh, more open. And uh, wow, but this, well, I didn't, I didn't see that one coming. That <laughs> is really cool. That is really cool. But I'm, I'm looking forward to the day I can uh, shake his hand and uh, thank him also for not just this, um, uh, this 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 topic, but everything else he's done because I uh, realize he's uh, he's more than just a UAP topic. I'm glad you enjoyed that. It's the very least that I could do, and wow. Lou was Lou was Lou was the one that suggested it before I even had the chance. So uh, there you go. I'll send that to you as well, so you've got your own little uh, copy of that. Um, let's jump into this question. Excuse me, I've got a mint in my mouth. Uh, from Yorne. So as a fellow Dutchie, having my own sightings, I know how hard it is to talk to other Dutchies about this. How was this for you to talk about with fellow pilots, friends, etc.? And were you actually able to? Ah, interesting question. Um, I'm not sure if if, if this uh, this person is also a pilot. Uh, normally, I don't discuss these topics with uh, with just anyone because uh, honestly, my life is is much more than than UAP. <laughs> actually, this 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 topic is just not something I even even think about discussing with other people um but um the topic sometimes comes up with uh, with other colleagues um you have to imagine you're flying a 747 from new york to to uh, to europe and you're spending six seven hours over the atlantic and you're staring at the stars and you're staring at the, the moonlight with nothing else to do but to to talk um then yeah naturally the topic comes up every now and then um and the interesting thing is that um, let's say a quarter of the pilots, one third of the pilots, they have actually seen something and they're re very reluctant to talk about it. Um, a one third of the pilots is just simply not interested, not even dismissing the subject, but simply not interested in it. And uh, some other people, they, they're simply not, in, not, 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 not willing to talk about it or not open to any kind of subject. So um, the moment this, the, the, the topic comes up, especially with, with other pilots, I'm able to talk about it. And um, it's, it's very interesting because uh, there will be a case we will discuss later on. It was in 2014, I think. Uh, there was a case about the red lights over the Pacific Ocean that I've seen, and this this went viral. It was just within 24 hours. It was on, on all the major newspapers. And uh, initially, I was really afraid that some of my colleagues would take um, uh, would would ridiculize me because even though. Um, 
I never thought that the uh, the lights we saw was anything related to aliens or the paranormal or you you name it. We actually thought there was a, a volcano just exploding below us. Um, but the media just just made it up as a under underwater UFO base that I took pictures of. Uh, and when I saw those headlines, I thought, ah, oh, now I'm going to be the, the laughing stock of the company, you know. Um, but uh, this was far from the case. I never received any um, ridiculizing comments. And actually, a lot of a lot of my colleagues, uh, veteran pilots, sometimes even ex-military pilots, uh, they came forward with their own theories, uh, with their own experiences, um, which was really revealing to me that this topic is uh, maybe taboo in, in society, but uh, um, really interesting for a lot of uh, uh, pilots and a lot a lot of people are interested in it so yeah talking about it i would only talk about it if the subject comes up and um, if people are open for it and if not then uh, just just don't even don't even bother because uh, i think if you if you force the subject on people who are not into it or open to it especially people who have not read themselves into the subject or have not done their homework um, it's still kind of a fringe topic and we have to progress very slowly towards the point that the subject becomes more mainstream, uh, more approachable. And um, once we, we've reached that point, we can finally um, uh, talk about it with other people who are not, not yet read into it. So um, I will just stick to the people who, who have the same experiences for now and, and let, the, let the, the, the conversation flow and let the topic grow naturally. Yeah, completely agree. Everyone has to come at this at their own pace. So yeah, fantastic. Now let's jump into some of these cases. So what we're going to do for everyone watching and listening, we're going to discuss uh, these cases in chronological order. So starting with the oldest, um, except for one case, we're going to leave to the end because that's kind of the, the most intriguing. Uh, so it's going to be a mixture of anomalous cases. Uh, well, they all started out anomalous, but some that you've actually done your due diligence and you've figured out what they are and, and you've come up with some prosaic explanations, which I think is a really good sign. It shows that you care about what you're seeing and that you're not just going to jump to conclusions or, you know, wild claims that it's a, a genuine UFO. So I think that's what we're going to see from some of these cases. But to yeah, start us off, sorry, go on. If, if, yeah, sorry. If, if I can quickly um, um, make a small addition, uh, these are just the, let's say, the most interesting cases that I've seen and most uh, inexplicable sightings. Uh, I did not include a lot of really strange things, tiny, tiny little things that I've seen that could be uh, very uh, mundane and prosaic. Uh, because a, a couple of times I've seen some stars just disappearing all of, all of a sudden when I'm gazing out at the star field and I'm, I'm just enjoying the, the, the view of the Milky Way. It happened maybe two or three times that all of a sudden one of the stars was just disappearing. I've absolutely no explanation for it, but I'm pretty sure it's it's maybe an atmospheric uh, uh, anomaly or 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 maybe it was even a satellite that was just uh, uh, tumbling and and stopped reflecting sunlight. Um, so um, there are maybe some things uh, I've missed that are really interesting. Maybe maybe the only actual genuine thing that I <laughs> that I missed and uh, discarded as as prosaic. Um, but uh, the the stuff that we are going to to go through now. Um, I did my best to write down all the details uh, as they as they came along. I wrote them down in my logbook, and as I said before, uh, you know, only back in 2018, 2019, I started catalogizing catalogizing them for myself and and basically um, trying to find out uh, what they what they were. So all the notes, all the locations, all the all the data, it was written down in my logbook uh, because I just wanted to know what it was and. Uh, Anyway, yeah, let's let's start. We have a lot of ground Fantastic. to cover. <laughs> yeah, so let's jump in with, with the first one, the falling light well, number one. So if you can just yeah tell us, I guess the location and dates, if you've got all of that information, and then go through like what you saw. Thank yeah, you. I'm just sometimes I'm looking down because I have my notes here, and uh, all the notes are are also in chronological order. Um, yeah, falling lights. Uh, I think that pretty much covers the <laughs> the phenomena. Uh, July 2005, we were flying with the Fokker 50, uh, somewhere over to southern Germany. It was uh, late evening. It was already uh, dark and we were flying in between two layers of clouds. Uh, I was pretty um, inexperienced still and I, I, I didn't have a lot of uh, experience with night flights. We had all the cockpit lights dimmed and all of a sudden uh, I was I was a co-pilot and I was looking towards my left. I was talking with my captain. So I'm basically looking towards the left side of the cockpit and through his windshield, through his window, 
uh, I suddenly saw a, a very bright white light just falling vertically down really fast and as it fell down it was it was going in a constant speed really fast as it fell down it basically dropped through the lower cloud layer it was illuminating the lower cloud layer in uh, for for maybe maybe one or two seconds and it dropped down below and the light disappeared and even my my captain who was more experienced he said no clue what it was and uh, there were no thunderstorms around there was just only these 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 really stable layers of of, of uh, stratus clouds uh, no electric uh, magnetic uh, anomalies or um, activity in the air so i have no clue what it was and um yeah this was the first sighting needless to say i i wasn't able to take any pictures because it happens instantly and it's it, it was gone um but this actually closely resembles another incident or another uh, light i saw uh, maybe five years later which you'll cover later on and um this really triggered me into wondering what it actually was because I've, i i simply have no clue what it was i've uh yeah, and i'm still looking for answers so this was the first thing that uh, that really um yeah surprised me from the air yeah and in a case like that or in that case did you or your or the main captain i suppose it was do they do you contact uh, air traffic control and ask if there's other traffic or was it just like don't know what that was carry on yeah basically just uh, i don't know what it is just just carry on uh nowadays um i i always ask them, uh, air traffic control if there's some military activity if there's any other traffic um yeah, actually, this was the uh, one of the few times that I never asked uh, the air traffic control what it was. Almost all the other cases I was asking. And ex the funny thing, because it's uh, it's it's kind of a small uh, sighting, it's maybe uh, insignificant, but it really triggered me into wondering what's sometimes happening in this in the sky. And maybe uh, even though it was absolutely insignificant, uh, it triggered my um, my reflex nowadays to write down all the details, what I see and, and where it was, and the date where it was, etc. And also to proactively just ask uh, um, air traffic control if there's any 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 whatever uh, military activity, all the traffic around. So. It's the first one. I know it's kind of underwhelming, but uh, no, I, th I don't one. think it is. I think it's fantastic. Got a, just a, a comment here that says, "Was it over land or sea?" Uh, this was southern Germany. It's overland. It was around the position of uh, the city of uh, Nuremberg, which is which is very far from um, any lakes, any mountains, any any anything there was just absolutely nothing around and with this Fokker 50 we were flying relatively low uh, far below regular air traffic so we're just as i said flying in between two air layers and there was a light just falling vertically down just bizarre really strange absolutely that's really really intriguing um let's move on to the next one shall we um yeah i'll i'll let you say the name and the date and things like that yeah um this was september 2005 um, it was either 28th, 29th or 30th. It was a really erratic and, and fast moving light in the sky. Um, uh, it happened so fast we weren't able to take any pictures. But what happened, uh, we were flying with this uh, Fokker 50, we were flying for uh, Olympic Airways for this uh, Greek airline. We were flying a lot of uh, island hopping out of Athens. We flew to all these small islands. And uh, we had a evening and uh, a night flight. So we were flying to two or three islands, I think including uh, the islands of Mykonos, or it must have been one of those islands. <laughs> And uh, we just landed on the runway, and since it's a small airport, we had to make a 180 uh, backtrack on the runway. So that means uh, we basically make a one uh, a degree of, sorry, a turn of 180 degrees on the runway. And the moment we started turning, the Fokker 50 had really big windows. My both of my colleague and I, we saw um, a really bright light, just. Uh, basically uh, as bright as, as, as a bright planet like like Mars or Jupiter you sometimes see in the sky it appeared it moved it disappeared it reappeared yeah it's, it's difficult to 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 tell you how far but it was like the width of the uh, of a full moon it reappeared again moved disappeared reappeared and all of a sudden it was stationary for maybe half a second one second and it shot away just like instant acceleration it was not even accelerating it was like instant speed and it was like a shooting star but in reverse it was just going at insane speeds i've never seen anything like this and uh, this is also one of the things that um, uh, uh, commander david Traver is talking about and and, and louis elizondo uh, and this really uh, I have no clue what it was because with my background as a pilot and a little bit of, of uh, aeronautical engineering, 
um, I tried to to evaluate the distance this this object or the light was actually from from us. Uh, but it's impossible to say because I mean it was just a bright light, so you have no dimensions, so no 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 parallax to compare it with. But let's say if it was at a normal uh, altitude of a normal airliner, let's say thirty thousand right. feet, um, it must have accelerated away with a speed of in excess Mark twenty Mark thirty. So that's wow. about 20, 20, 30 times as as fast as a normal airliner, uh, twenty times the, the speed of sound. And maybe that's even a low estimate. Um, if it was even higher, because it's it's it, it, it's impossible to judge how high it was. But if yeah. it was really high, like uh, um, um, low Earth orbit, it must have been uh, insane, absolutely insane. And this is the type of characteristic characteristics that is being discussed quite often by those military pilots as well. Um, and this was this was uh, strange. The funny thing was that, that same evening we basically concluded uh, that it. It must have been something military because the um, uh, the carrier strike group, the uh, USS uh, Theodore Roosevelt, I think it was, it was a nuclear um, aircraft carrier with all the support ships, was just passing by just south of Greece, uh, just on its way to the Persian Gulf. And uh, we just thought, you know, it's probably like a, uh, some fancy military equipment or a missile or, or something like that. Um, and only later I heard that this is also thanks to Ms. Elizondo and, and, uh, and other uh, people that came forward, um, that many of those lights uh, are being seen near nuclear installations, both uh, nuclear power plants, but also um, uh, nuclear naval vessels, but even the, I think it was the, the USS Princeton, this, this, this uh, uh, guided cruise missile uh, uh, cruiser, I think it was. Um, so there's a lot of Strange activity going uh, going on around navy ships and, and nuclear installations, and that actually, in retrospect, makes me wonder what we saw there. And yeah. uh, purely mechanical perspective, I cannot explain what it was because it, the acceleration was instantaneous. And by the way, when it was uh, appearing, reappearing, disappearing, reappearing, and shooting away, it was still in one continuous line. So it was following the same trajectory, um, but it seemed to be um, very unnatural. Let's say, what color was it? The light? Just, just pure white. Just pure right. white. Yeah, and it was it's... like, uh, yeah. No, carry on, carry on. Yeah, it, it was like the the, uh, the size of a of a of a small planet, uh, like we see normally in the in the sky. Uh, but the behavior was was um, inexplicable. Yeah, and it's funny you mentioned the uh, USS Theodore Roosevelt. That was the ship that was involved in the the sightings off of the East Coast in 2015. Oh, so that's very funny. It'd be very easy to kind of make those connections, but it, you know, could be purely coincidental. But very interesting point indeed. So, I, I, yeah. I didn't realize that because uh, the the reason why we uh, why we knew it it was in the uh, the flight preparation. We we looked through the NOTAMS, which stands for Notice to All Airmen, which is basically a briefing package which says, uh, you know. The, this and this beacon is is out of service. This part of the airspace is closed. Uh, be careful. There's a there's a there's a tower or an antenna uh, being built there. Uh, but it also includes uh, the closure of airspace as there is military activity. And in this case, um, there was indicated black and white that the that this carrier group was passing by and that there was a whole block of airspace basically closed for civilian air, air, airplanes as this uh, task group was was was, uh, was going by. So that's how we knew there was a, a, some military activity going on. But I never linked it to any sort of UAP or, or it, it just struck me. and. Uh, I was really wondering, you know, if this is the kind of jets that these guys are flying, and they, they should make a new kind of Top Gun because it's like, fuck, this is real. This is this is really cool equipment. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't I don't know what what to think about it. But it was really really mind blowing, and uh, I'm still I'm still hoping to get a, a prosaic explanation for it because uh, you know it it was clearly not natural. There there's no way a natural object can can accelerate like that, um, and no matter no matter what it is, the the implications uh, are insane. If this is man-made technology, if this is a black budget rocket or a spaceship or even a drone, wow! This is this is groundbreaking technology. This would this would rewrite the uh, uh, the laws of uh, of aerodynamics. Um, that would be really cool. And maybe it's something else. I don't know, but I just want to know what <laughs> I want to know what it is. It's because yeah. it's so cool. It's it's really <laughs> from a, from from a, from a pilot perspective, it's just uh, nice to see. Yeah, no, fascinating case as uh, again. Um, 
so yeah let's move on to the third anomalous case that we're going to talk about which is uh, another falling light case yeah uh yeah that was right uh, february 28th 2009 um this is also interesting because it 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 greatly resembles the first falling light i've seen this case i was flying with a 737 boeing 737 from um i think it was crete uh, back to amsterdam and it was a daylight flight cafe okay weather it's like meaning no clouds uh, visibility was almost unlimited uh, and we were following the greek um albanian coastline and we were okay. just flying towards the north uh, north uh, west and we were just chatting, just like actually the first time with the falling lights. And I was looking towards my uh, my captain, and so basically I was I had uh, the wind sh windshield on the on the left hand side in full view. And both of us we saw almost a similar uh, bright white light falling with almost the same speed um, straight down, and it disappeared in the Adriatic Sea. And if I have to estimate the location, it must have been um, just over the border between Albania and uh, Greece uh, on the Albanian sides. Well, let's say 15 or 20 kilometers from the coastline into the water. Uh, and it just disappeared into the water. Um, I didn't see any any splash or, or, or flash. Uh, it doesn't say anything because we were actually flying so high. I mean, we're talking about... 38,000 feet, so uh, it's almost impossible to, uh, to, to see any details uh, on the surface of the ocean, but it was falling rapidly. And if I have to estimate the, the vertical speed, I think it, it dropped down uh, from our altitudes, because that's actually the moment we saw it when it was passing below the, the window frame and into view, um, right. two seconds. Uh, from thirty thousand feet to to sea level, roughly. Yeah, that's 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 more or less. So that's an insane speed. And um, mm. um, in this case, I immediately asked the air traffic controller, which was a Greek uh, guy we were still talking to, if there was any military activity in the Adriatic Sea or the airspace ahead of us. Um, first of all, because I thought maybe maybe we overlooked some really important uh, notes or airspace closure, and that's kind of embarrassing if you if you fly into a uh, closed airspace as a as a commercial pilot. Uh, but no, he was uh, he was almost kind of agitated. He said, "No, no, no activity. Just contact uh, whatever it is, the next guy." And we contacted the Albanian air traffic controller. Um, he just cleared us direct to a normal route, and uh, which was kind of normal. I immediately asked him as well if there was any military activity, and he was really surprised. He said, "No, there's just there's no no traffic, no activity, no nothing whatsoever happening uh, to the north or to the west of you." So that um, showed to me that it was at least no commercial traffic, yeah. which is kind of a. Uh, uh, um, uh, we, which would have been kind of strange if if, if it was a falling commercial object. Um, I've I've got no clue what it what it was. It was really strange. And if it was a meteor, I've seen millions of meteors and shooting stars. Um, first of all, they burn up high in the atmosphere, and if they make it down towards the Earth, uh, they never fall down in a vertical path. They always go yeah. down in, in a shallow path. Uh, it was also white light, bright white, so it was not like a burning uh, rock or just something something very hot. It was pure white light and it just fell down and it disappeared. And that's under the end of the Under the ocean, it went straight in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At least this was this was my uh, perception. Sure, right. Yeah. Okay, I guess yeah. you can't say for, for okay. certain, but wow. It yeah. Baffles. It, yeah, you put yourself, I mean, I put myself in that, in that situation and you just, yeah, that's, that's something else. Yeah, and also um, I think it's it's important to note, and this this is not only applicable to this falling light, but basically for me as a as a pilot, uh, as as a as a trained observer. Um, first of all, um, I'm I'm only concerned about the safety of my flight and sure. my passengers yeah. or the the cargo we carry, um, and the very last thing on my mind is. Um, wondering if this is something anomalous or a UAP or something interesting. The only thing I'm interested in is, uh, does it affect my flight path? Does it affect my airplane? Is it something weather related that we have to avoid? Um, is it some other traffic maybe that we that we have to keep in mind? Um, so that's the way I'm always looking out of my window. That's the way I interpret my instruments and I'm flying my airplane. And I think this is very important for people to remember that uh, because I guess a lot of people will start complaining. So, oh, he doesn't have any pictures. It's only anecdotal evidence or any, <laughs> not even evidence. It's just an anecdote. So, yeah. 
but I'm, I'm there to fly the airplane. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in the cockpit. I'm being paid to fly the airplane as safe uh, as possible. So the last thing on my mind is, is um, uh, taking pictures when there's something going on because I have to, uh, I have to be uh, in my role as a pilot. So um, it's also very good to keep in mind that every time I see something like that, I'm not instantly jumping to conclusions like, wow, this must be interesting or this must be... Uh, an alien from uh, Zeta, uh, what's it called? R R R Zeta uh, Reticuli. Yeah, that one. <laughs> uh, no, pretty far from it. And actually, I I doubt if if any of these things are uh, relatable to <laughs> to to aliens. But um, yeah, so I just I, I just want to have it cleared up that for me as a pilot, and this applies to to all the pilots, both military and commercially, we're there um, with a mission, uh, either or it's 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 either a military mission or we're there to operate the flight. So um, just to take away any doubts for people that think that I'm jumping to conclusions here or there. Yeah, and I'd just like to say as well, we're now going to start looking at some sightings which you have captured images of. But I mean, one thing I'll say about the first three is it sounds like even if you were to want to take a photograph of those things, it happened almost in an instant or over a couple of seconds, even if you'd done what you needed to do in the cockpit, am I right in saying by the time you got your camera, it, it would have just been no point anyway. Yeah. And it also uh, makes me wonder how much I missed because I'm flying now for 20 years. And um, I, for anyone who's ever uh, visited the cockpit of an airliner, uh, the windows are actually kind of small. And we're sitting there. Um, most of the time, we're looking inside because we're literally flying on instruments. Uh, either we're talking with each other, we're doing the, the radio. And the time I'm actually looking outside through these relatively small windows is kind of limited. So sometimes I'm wondering, you know, maybe I've, I've missed the most spectacular phenomena outside and and i've never even noticed it so these are just a handful of things that i've seen and and uh yeah i can testify that that i cannot cannot explain what i've what i've seen so far yeah now the th first case that we're going to look at here that you 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 know is, is certainly very strange but you have figured it out in the end i think is the red lights over the pacific is is this the one you mentioned earlier that kind of went viral and appeared in, in the news so yeah, yeah if you want to talk us through this one that's uh, going to be interesting yeah, yeah. Uh, just just feel free to show the pictures as we as we discuss it. Um, this was in the night of twenty four and 25th of August, two thousand fourteen. Um, I was flying an airplane from uh, Hong Kong to Anchorage. We were flying uh, over the Pacific Ocean for about uh, nine and a half ten hours straight. Um, that very night, um, we had a briefing package, both for the weather and the NOTAMs. Uh, there was some military activity going on. I think the Americans were testing a hypersonic missile out of the uh, Aleutian Islands, southern Alaska. Um, and there were a lot of um, erupting volcanoes that flight. Uh, they were erupting basically around the, the so-called Ring of Fire, the Pacific Ring of Fire. So there were volcanoes erupting in um, uh, southern Japan, in Indonesia. Uh, Alaska, uh, North America. Uh, well, at least we had. A, there were a couple of earthquakes in North America. There were volcanoes erupting in South America. Um, so we were pretty um, um, well informed about possible ash clouds and all the stuff that that we might encounter as pilots there. Uh, yeah, most yeah. of these uh, ash stamps, as they are called, or the um, the warnings about uh, volcanic activity, it comes from satellite data or pilot reports. So if if I sometimes see something anomalous like a volcano exploding or erupting, we have to report it because sometimes we're just the first ones or the only ones to see it. Um, so we were really on the lookout for anything that, that might endanger our flight, like flying in an ash cloud, which is basically uh, uh, very dangerous. Um, all of a sudden, uh, we were, I think, about three hours in flight. We were flying uh, north of Japan, just uh, far east of Kamchatka. Um, we, we we dimmed all the lights and this was typical one of those evenings that we were talking about the universe and life and uh, you name it cars <laughs> <laughs> uh, and um i just had my meal in the oven and i was waiting for it to finish and we were just looking out for the stars and um, all of a sudden on the horizon we saw a very bright flash of light which is um which completely surprised us because we uh, we had no clue where it uh where it came from. Yeah, this was basically the view as we as we saw it with the naked eye. And around the area of the red lights in the far distance, there was this really, really bright flash of light. But there were no thunderstorms reported. Uh, there were no thunderstorms on our weather radar, etc. And it really triggered our imagination, uh, wondering what it was. 
And about half an hour later, or maybe maybe 10 hours, 10 minutes later, we saw this um, glow on the horizon appearing. And these red lights basically started to show up as we came closer. Um, it was pure coincidence that they were just below our flight path. So we basically mm -hmm. approached them head on. We flew over it. And uh, I have... I still have no clue if it's connected to the bright flash of light. Maybe it's it's probably completely unrelated, um, but we were baffled and we had no clue what was going on. Um, flying there, and in, <laughs> keep in mind, we uh, we were on the on the lookout for uh, volcanoes and ash clouds and you name it. Uh, we were really spooked when we saw this because our first reaction was uh, there's like a. a magnetic um, uh, undersea eruption or there's some volcano uh, blowing off steam or something is happening there that might endanger our airplane. Uh, but as we as we came closer, we saw that these lights, uh, these individual lights, they were completely steady. They were not burning. They were not, not flickering like you would see with a forest fire sometimes. Uh, they even had uh, green and, and white lights. Um, and that was really strange, but still, uh, the, our, our hearts were beating in our throats because we were just so afraid of flying into an ash cloud. So yeah, basically, yeah. we stayed. We tried. We, we we decided to maintain our course and to stay clear of any possible clouds or weather, and just let the lights be what they were. Uh, so, uh, yeah, we took. I, I took a lot of pictures of it, and uh, after uploading them uh, the next day, <laughs> they went viral. And this was uh, it was it was crazy what happened. What happened then? The funny thing is, for people wondering how big these lights are, um, I don't know if I sent you the picture as, picture as well, but two days later, I was flying from Anchorage to Chicago. We were overflying Canada, the city of uh, Winnipeg, I think, and we were flying at exactly the same altitude um, at night, and I took um, a similar picture over the city of Winnipeg, and you can actually compare the size between uh, the city yeah, yeah. and the group of lights. And, do you happen to have it with you there? That's it. Yeah. So uh, top is the picture with the red lights over the Pacific. We were flying, um, I don't know, must have been, let's say, 32,000 feet. And below, we were flying at the same altitude. And that's the city of Winnipeg, which is about 20 or 25 kilometers in diameter. Uh, so uh, taking that into account, um, you can see that the spread of the red of the, the red group of lights is about 30 to 35 kilometers in total, and each individual light is about the size of a football stadium. Right. Um, yeah, so for a long time I had no clue what it was. Uh, up to uh, roughly six months, seven months ago, um, apparently another pilot took pictures of these red lights, and they have now been identified as being uh, uh, a Chinese fishing fleet, which is fishing for sari. Um, and um, even though I think the lights are still pretty big for fishing fleets, uh, I think it's kind of explained uh, by now. Because I think it was also last year, there, was a, um, uh, there were some pictures taken in the port of Shanghai, and the entire sky was, was glowing red. And they were, yeah. they were basically explained as being a fishing fleet testing their lights. Uh, and that explained to me the, the, the red glow. And the main, oh yeah, maybe it's good to mention the main reason why I I, um, I didn't think it was a fishing fleet to begin with, because uh, fishing fleets always use white or green light because the white and green wavelengths actually do penetrate seawater, and a red light doesn't penetrate seawater at all. So it doesn't make sense to to hunt for fish or to to, to try and catch fish. Uh, because fish are simply not attracted to it, from from what I read in the literature. Um, but six months ago, I found out that actually what they try to do is not uh, lure those fish in, but to calm them, because the fish don't see the light, so they need illumination for, for the fishing nets and for the operation. So apparently the fish get really calm and, uh, and cozy when they see those red lights, and they're easy, easier to fish out of the ocean. So... Long story short, it was fun while it lasted, but um, I think it's kind of kind of uh, explained as a mundane and uh, um, interesting sight, but uh, nothing nothing to get excited about. <laughs> yeah, but I think one of the reasons why we and like we said earlier that, that we're showing these cases that have been uh, figured out is that it shows the work that you're putting in after seeing something. You know, it really does highlight that you you're not just jumping to conclusions. And, you know, the, the case there, you, you mentioned about the, the sky going red last year. I, I remember that popping up all over uh, sort of the UFO community with all sorts of theories attached to it. So, you know, it, it can happen that, that 
people just go for the wildest ex explanations first. So, you know, it, it's great. It, it's really good. Uh, so yeah. let's move on to the next one, which what, I believe... Uh, which if, if, you, if, you, if you don't mind, uh, what's what really sure. interesting with these, uh, with these red lights is that uh, I received uh, literally maybe a thousand emails from people all over the world. Um, <laughs> some people going completely mental with their own philosophies about uh, the paranormal, and um, which was kind of uh, interesting to, 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 to read. Um, yeah. But yeah, I couldn't really do anything with that. Uh, but I also received some emails from, from from some scientists, including a couple of American and Russian scientists, and they uh, they in my they they saw the explanation for their theories in my pictures that there is some sort of a, a possible electrical discharge between the upper parts of the atmosphere and the lower parts of the atmosphere because apparently and don't don't quote me on it because i'm i'm, I'm not a, a, an expert on it but with uh, thunderstorms there's a lot of uh, electromagnetical discharge i think from the ground to the air or the other way around and um, some scientists are wondering how how nature or how the planet is, is rebalancing those kind of uh, um, magnetic uh, uh, yeah, anomalies. So they propose that there must be some kind of a phenomenon here and there that's actually balancing out the electromagnetical discharge or charge from the upper atmosphere uh, to the ground. Um, really interesting, but then again, still, <laughs> we found out it's just a bunch of fishing fleets. Uh, but this also made me wonder if this could maybe potentially explain the falling lights I've seen earlier. Uh, it seems highly unlikely to me because it's, it's far from a lightning strike, but... Uh, I don't know. Um, anyway, that was interesting to see. But among all those emails, and this was pretty cool, uh, there was a forwarded email by someone else who was who was trying to to find out uh, what it was. And I saw that the original email came from his buddy working for BAE, British Aerospace Engineering, the British weapon uh, manufacturer. Yeah. And so I saw he, he, he deleted the name, but I could still see it was coming from a senior weapons uh, analyst in BAE uh, Aerospace. And then I realized that my pictures, they were not only going viral among the UFO community and uh, 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 <laughs> the, the pilot community, but they have been taken very serious by, uh, by weapon analysts. And uh, that was pretty cool. So I realized that my uh, pictures, sometimes taken from the air, are really valuable because I'm sitting in a unique position. So you can imagine the jokes around the, the breakfast table among all the pilots, you know, <laughs> They're saying, you know, Ob Obama just wakes up and the first thing he gets on his desk <laughs> uh, is um, a briefing package with the red lights uh, taken by a Dutch pilot. So, um, yeah, I'm, this was the red lights uh, incident. And it, it really showed me uh, not only how some things can be explained very prosaically, because I, I was I was going through many theories myself. Uh, and, and in the end, it just it just happened to be a, a stupid fishing fleet. But it showed also to me that a lot of people are are interested in in, in these kind of sightings. So it was kind of uh, encouraging uh, to me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and as a last note, before we continue, um, hmm. in, initially, as I said before, I was really afraid that my colleagues would actually um, uh, make fun of me or or try to uh, ridiculize it. Um, far from it. Far from it. And this incident triggered a lot of. A lot of my colleagues to come forward with their own stories as well. Um, I, I have to leave it up to my colleagues to come forward with their own testimonies, etc. But yeah. some of the stories that some of my colleagues, and I'm talking about really experienced pilots, uh, have told me are uh, baffling, absolutely baffling. And um, um, yeah, uh, it, it's, uh, it doesn't really help anything for the conversation if I start to tell, and, and tell, tell those stories. But it showed to me that uh, a lot of pilots are seeing stuff. And um, I think it's, in, in a sense, it was, it was nice to see people opening up. Yeah, absolutely. And it's good to know that it is happening. And, you know, anyone's welcome to come forward. And, and I appreciate that some have many reasons why they don't want to. But, you know, and if you ever mention it, they're, they're always welcome here. We can always talk m a lot beforehand. So, you know, I always like to put that out there. So thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Moving on. Um, we've got the space debris. Which these photographs are. Crazy. Yeah. 
And this is also something that's been seen more and more often since um, uh, more and more space debris is basically burning up nowadays. Um, and I've seen, um, yeah, exactly. I've seen quite a lot of posts on, on social media here and there of uh, moving images of this space debris. And it looks absolutely uh, mesmerizing. But a lot of people are immediately jumping to conclusions like, oh, this is Starlink. Uh, this, is, uh, this is aliens. This is UFOs. And this is really something very mundane. Uh, it's basically an old rocket part burning up in the upper atmosphere. Uh, I never expected this one. It was really cool. We were flying, uh, let me see, it was uh, May 28th, uh, 2017. We were flying uh, between Africa and South America in the mid-Atlantic Ocean. And uh, as you can see, you know, I had a camera already ready to capture the Milky Way and some shooting stars. And we were talking about uh, the universe and all kinds of funny things. And all of a sudden, from the corner of my eye, I was sitting on the right-hand seat, uh, from the corner of my eye, I see we're being overtaken by another airplane. And this shouldn't be because we're completely alone over the ocean. <laughs> yeah. And instantly, I realized, wait a minute, there's something going on because it's much higher than we are and it's glowing and there's something, something off here. And I was looking at it and uh, this is a 30 second exposure. So um, it shows it as a blurry long line, but it was like a big ball of, 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 um, uh, yeah, a glowing ball with all all sorts of debris and parts um, falling off and burning up in the ocean as it went along. It was really cool to see, and uh, fortunately, we both immediately identified it as as uh, as uh, some space debris burning up. We had no clue what it was, uh, and it was visible for about one and a half minutes, and it was just going over the uh, across the horizon and burning up in the atmosphere, and. Um, this was pretty cool. Um, it took me about a week to get the uh, the final answer on what kind of space debris it was. And there was right. one gentleman, um, I should have written down his name, I, I forgot his name. Uh, but as a hobby, he is he's tracking all sorts of space debris. Uh, and um, he, he saw my pictures, he contacted me, and he said, well, this really resembles the Chinese uh, rocket booster from whatever which was uh, uh, launched five or six years earlier and it was just orbiting the earth and basically it's a matter of time before it's uh, it slowly starts descending towards uh, uh, um, uh, parts of the atmosphere where it's getting more and more friction and eventually burning up in in maybe two or three minutes time and it's impossible to say where it will exactly um, hit the uh, uh, the point that it starts breaking up or burning up because it's just so unpredictable with tumbling around and, and atmospheric uh, changes. So, um, yeah, it was identified. I could almost identify the type of uh, the type of rocket it was, and uh, yeah, that was it. And I took this picture just after the incident. This is uh, the instruments, the navigation display, and on the lower uh, left-hand corner, you see the um, uh, GPS coordinates as well. Just try oh, to so you it. logged it, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's interesting. It, it kind of links into a degree with this question from Blue Eyes, and thank you for the $5 donation and becoming a member, Blue Eyes. Thank you so much. He's asking if you've confirmed any of the sightings with radar operators as well. Um, no. No, uh, unfortunately not, uh, in the sense that I've, I've asked many radar operators or air traffic controllers if they see anything on radar. Uh, we will go in more detail with the later, with the last case, uh, this, uh, the case over Spain, um, because that's actually an interesting uh, uh, story about air traffic controllers. Uh, the big point is people um, have to realize that uh, nowadays air traffic control, both uh, military and civil, I, I think it's also military, they use a system that's not using primary radar. So in the old days, let's say the uh, the, the first years of, 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 of radar usage, they were using a radar signal and every time it was bouncing back from an object, there was like a, a, a ping, there was something showing yeah. up on the radar display. Nowadays, because there's so much clutter, there are birds, it's weather, it's like it's so much stuff going on. Um, modern air traffic control works with a with a radar that's sending out a signal, and um, the moment that the transponder in the airplane receives that signal, it sends all all sorts of data back, and only those kind of radar responses are being plotted on the radar chart. So nowadays, an air traffic controller they do not have an old radar display that shows all the objects in the sky; it just shows the uh, the airplanes with a specific uh, transponder setting back on the radar display. And this is very important to keep in mind because a radar operator, like an air traffic controller, um, 
they probably don't see any um, uh, any objects in the in the airspace that don't have a, a man-made aviation approved transponder um, okay. I think it might be different for military operators, and I think we've seen also with uh, testaments from uh, Commander David Fravor and the Navy incidents uh, that the Spy 2 uh, radars, they were picking up objects uh, yeah. from the, uh, I think it was the radar ceiling, 80,000 feet up to sea level. So these kind of radars are very sophisticated, and they work on a completely different um, uh, um, system logic. Uh, so I cannot say anything about military aircraft radars, but uh, normally air traffic control, they can only say if they're aware of military traffic going on. So um, yeah, that's that's kind of a useless source, but at least it, sometimes it can confirm there's some man-made uh, equipment flying around, playing around. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate yeah. that. So let's move on to the ICBM launch, if that's all right. Yeah. Um, I'll just quickly say thank you, Shelley, again for the ten dollars. You guys are awesome, so generous. Thank you so much. Um, right, let me bring up these. Oh, Christopher Plain, how's it going? There you go. Military still use traditional yeah. radar that plots all physical objects they see. Awesome. Thank you for clarifying. Good to see you, Christopher. Right, yes. What we got? Did I say it's the ICBM launch? And the one thing I will say is that these photographs even though they're prosaic explanations, they're still absolutely stunning looking at those cloud fields, uh, star fields, sorry. It's just phenomenal. And this is certainly bizarre. Let's bring this one up and then you can uh, explain it. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like one of those uh, pins from Google Earth, uh, literally placed <laughs> on Earth, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this was pretty cool. Uh, this was over uh, northern China, and uh, this was a, a planned um, a rocket test. And uh, we knew it already beforehand because there was an airspace closure uh, just north of our route and uh, much further south of our route. So we knew there was some um, some launch or some kind of uh, uh, activity going on. But we were really surprised to actually see it popping up like this. So as you can see, the sun was already setting. It was actually, it was already set behind, uh, below the horizon. And there was only this, this, this glow of the atmosphere left. And all of a sudden we saw this pin just rising up and uh, it was going pretty fast. And um, yeah, basically it was, yeah, there we go. So this is the first stage that's, that's being burning up. And as it go, grows higher and higher, uh, the ambient air pressure is decreasing, so the exhaust gases start expanding. And you see nowadays with these uh, SpaceX launches, where you see yeah. this huge plume, it's, it's basically because of the very low ambient air pressure that the plume is just expanding rapidly. And if you go to the next picture, uh, next one. Yeah, here you see that the second stage is, is uh, starting the ignition already. So for me, when I saw this with the, with the two different plumes, uh, it was clear that it was uh, a, a rocket, and uh, yeah, we we immediately knew what it was, and we were just enjoying the view because it was uh, pretty cool to see. Yeah, absolutely. And is this a uh, cloud layer here? Yeah, cloud layer. It's just hidden in the shadows because it's basically already night, and the only light that we see is, uh, is 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 from the sun that's already behind the horizon. No, it's, it is like you said. It's absolutely stunning to to look at. So, yeah. I suppose if you knew that straight away, you know, there's not much to sort of sort of follow up on that one. But yeah, that's good then that you actually are told in advance of things that are happening nearby, whether it be ICBM launches and rocket tests and things like that. You always get that information. So that's really handy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even though sometimes uh, the briefing package of, of no terms which is almost like this big. So you go through <laughs> it a little bit. Yeah, OK, OK, we find out. And sometimes you miss something because basically what we look for is all the information that's relevant to our flight path and routes and uh, sometimes with with rocket launches like these um they're in a in a no time package a briefing package that's that's talking about a, a completely different country where we're not even flying so sometimes right. um i'm not always reading up on all the no times but in this case it was a it was a clear case of uh, uh enjoy the show and uh <laughs> sit back we're sitting yeah, for a drive. <laughs> Um, one thing we've not really gone into so far is the kind of equipment that you've been using camera wise. So, so far, we've obviously had the red light over the Pacific, the space debris, and then this ICBM launch. So what kind of cameras were you using and, and lenses as well? 
Um, I'm not sure if I can mention the brand, but I'll just do it anyway. Um, I'm solely using uh, using uh, Nikon, Nikon, um, and I started uh, basically from the time I was flying in Afghanistan, etc., with the D80, which is a very small DSLR camera. Um, and um, over the years, I upgraded from the D80 to the D200 to the D800, D850, and now I'm using the Z7, Z7, um, which is a, a mirrorless um, high-end camera, really some of the best uh, actually there are. And I'm using uh, mostly uh, professional uh, high-grade lenses. So I'm using 2.8 lenses. Sometimes I take pictures with the fisheye, like the, the, the rocket debris burning up, and also the red lights. I took with the 10.5, uh, 2.8 millimeter. Uh, which is extreme wide angle lens um, and I'm mostly using the 1424 wide angle lens for the AV for the photography nerds it's it's probably you know, no material uh, but it's it's really great stuff and uh, I also carry the 70 sorry no the 24 70 millimeter 2.8 with me the big problem is with photography from the cockpit uh, we have to take pictures through really really thick layered glass sometimes six yeah. layers um, and it's like, uh, it, it's impossible to get sharp pictures if you zoom in too far, which, um, when I started taking pictures from the cockpit was a, was a huge disappointment because there's so many beautiful things to see, especially mountain ridges in the background, etc. Uh, but I basically forced myself to use wide angle lenses because by using wide angle lenses, you, you, uh, you avoid the distortion on the, uh, of the windows. Um, so long story short, I'm using these wide angle lenses to take pictures from the cockpit. And uh, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's the equipment I uh, carry with me now. Yeah, and I will just reiterate to everybody to please go and check out uh, Christian's Instagram accounts and that where he puts so many beautiful and stunning photographs. Uh, before we jump on to this next case, I thought this one was uh, kind of amusing. It says, publish a book. Well, <laughs> you know, you've, I think you've got two books out, haven't you? Uh, yeah, actually, the first book came out in 2016. It's called uh, Cargo Pilot uh, because uh, I'm flying cargo, uh, and it was it was funny. I met my uh, uh, my the, the author of my book, um, uh, <laughs> and um, only later I realized he was an uh, sorry. I met the publisher of my book, and only later I realized he was a publisher. And he told me, um, you know, actually, you have so many cool stories. Let's make a book about it. The problem is, I expect there will be an audience net audience worldwide of 200 aviation nerds that might be interested in it <laughs> but let's let's just go for it because he's a, he's a publisher um uh, in a niche market of aviation books so uh, we came up with a great design uh and the book was uh, selling like crazy i think it's already in the fifth print run now and uh, since i upgraded to uh, captain last year we decided to make the fifth print run the the captain's edition uh, which is out now and it's uh, it basically covers um my whole career from flying the fokker in afghanistan Africa all the way to flying the 747 and it's mainly focusing on flying the 747 the airplane the destinations the the, the, the clouds the northern lights you name it and also one chapter is dedicated to the red lights of the Pacific and mm -hmm. keep in mind it was written the moment we were still wondering what it was so uh, a <laughs> um, new edition will actually come up with a, with a solution of the fishing fleet but uh, yeah the book is out and actually as we speak I'm I'm, uh, I'm I'm busy with with coming up with a new book because uh, I want to expand my my photography into uh, um, yeah into more books and stuff. But it's it takes so much time and, and, and energy, and uh, it's, it's 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 the two things I really lack right now. But uh, yeah, it will uh, it will come up in the future. But uh, one one book is already out, and people can find it on my web shop if they want to. But I don't want to talk about these kind of uh, uh, things like books, etc., because I, I don't want to muddy the waters, and I just want to. In this interview, at least, I just want to focus on the uh, on the anomalies and the uh, uh, the weird and interesting things that we sometimes see in the uh, in the air. I understand completely. I understand. Yeah, I just want, I just mentioned it because that comment was like, it, yeah, yeah. Cool. It, so yeah, let's move on then. Um, this one is the cosmic ray. Yeah, so let's That's... bring this. Go for it. 
Yeah, this is an interesting one as well. Um, actually, because it's so uh, <laughs> underwhelming. Um, the picture was taken April 5th, 2020, over the North Atlantic. Um, and um, I was, I think, during that flight alone, I took maybe 50 or 60 pictures. Uh, this is the raw picture as it came from my camera. And I just right. put them on my, uh, on my computer and I never had time to look at them anymore until about, uh, I think, six months or seven months ago and i was going through these pictures with the moon and uh, and i was i was looking for some stuff to to work on and when browsing through these pictures i just noticed this little light streak um in only one of those i took maybe six pictures in a time span of 20 seconds and this was the only one that had the little uh light streak in it and i think there's also one where i zoomed in on the little light streak ah yeah and um i have no clue what it was because i took so many pictures after each other and as i said from a whole series of five or six pictures this was the only one with this little light streak in it uh, i didn't see it with the naked eye uh, and as i said you know i only only noticed it on the file two years later um i posted it online asking my followers what they think it was and a lot of people already commented that it uh, it might have been a, a cosmic ray um which, which might have well been. It's one of those high energy particles shooting through the uh, through the uh, the universe at all times. Uh, most of them are filtered out by the Earth atmosphere, but some mm -hmm. are actually uh, coming through. And um, if they hit a sensor of a camera, they just show up as these little light streaks. And sometimes um, you hear it from pilots, but also um, especially astronauts that are. Um, venturing above the, the largest mass of the atmosphere you see these little light flashes in your eyes and astronauts have it more often apollo astronauts had it a lot as well because yeah. they were so far out of the uh, the earth's protective uh, magnetosphere but uh, yeah i think it's one of those particles that just just hit the sensor and uh, left this little uh, light streak um as we speak, this image is being analyzed by um, uh, IPACO. I'm probably butchering the, the French word. <laughs> IPACO is a part of, um, uh, actually it's run by the same people who are working in uh, Gaipan, which is okay. the French organization uh, to identify aerial anomalies. They're part of the, the French uh, Space Force, the Defense Force, I think. Uh, I'm in contact with um, uh, Mr. Tonio Cousin. Yeah, I'm probably butchering his name, but uh, my apologies for that. Um, he was interested in the red lights already, and he's now working to analyze both this image and the Spanish image we're going to talk about in the end, uh, <laughs> cliffhanger. Um, <laughs> but uh, he already confirmed that it's highly likely a cosmic ray, but they find it such a nice example uh, that they want to use this picture in their database as a, um, as a gold standard for what a cosmic ray in the sky with a picture looks like. So uh, a, final, uh, yeah, a final analysis is being done, and we just have to wait for the, uh, for the report to come out. But uh, I thought it was interesting to show because um, some people might just jump to conclusions and say, oh, it's, it's aliens or it's, uh, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> uh, UFOs. But I think it's, uh, it's also good to include those, those very mundane uh, anomalies from camera sensors as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a beautiful image. Absolutely. So fantastic. Let's jump across. So we've got two more before we get to the final one. Um, diffuse light over Germany, a moving light. Now, I think this is the one that we've got a video for as well that you've shared with me on, on YouTube. Is that the one? Yeah. So let's, uh, do you wanna, let's watch the video first sorry everyone i've got multiple screens so i'm flip-flopping from all sides of the thing here we go let's watch this this is a yeah This is uh, a series of uh, maybe uh, 30 or 40 pictures I took uh, with the wide angle lens, uh, basically uh, letting it rest on the glare shield against uh, the front window of the airplane. So the black part you see on the right hand and the lower corner is basically the, the nose of the airplane and the window frame. And um, all of a sudden we saw this, yeah, this is a nice indication of how I position my camera. Uh, those are the instruments below and that's my camera just pointing up 
and uh, I always call it a fire and forget camera. So I just press a button and I'll just let it take 50 pictures. And right. uh, ho ho hopefully there's a, a shooting star or uh, or a nice Milky Way visible in the end. So uh, that's the setup. And that's how I took these pictures. And all of a sudden, flying over southern Germany, we saw this, uh, this really bright light popping up from the uh, left-hand corner. And it was starting to glow. It was pure white, by the way. It's just a white balance on the camera that's making it look uh, greenish. Okay. Um, but the uh, the light became uh, kind of diffuse and it started to glow as it as it basically moved towards the north. And I've seen the ISS also millions of times, and I knew this was not the, the standard uh, orbit of the ISS. And uh, we were really wondering what it was because there were no notams, there was no um, message or uh, information about uh, any 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 rocket launches or space debris, uh, you name it. Um, so I was kind of clueless, and I was really wondering what we what we saw there. I was pretty pretty sure and convinced that what we saw was some sort of a re-entry of of something. Especially the the diffuse glow around it made me uh, realize it was probably a deorbit, like you sometimes see with uh, SpaceX uh, boosters as well. Uh, but it was on a trajectory that didn't make any sense. So I posted it online. And fortunately, the next day, or maybe two days later, there was uh, one gentleman, uh, Jonathan, uh, I forgot his name. You see it probably in the next, yeah, that one, Jonathan, Jonathan McDowell. McDowell. Yeah, and he, was, um, he wasn't even aware of my sighting. And uh, he was uh, keeping track of this uh, Angara AM-D orbit, apparently a Russian uh, booster. Um, and he drew that line. That was the, uh, the red line on the left. That's the actual yeah. track that the D-orbit made. And uh, it completely cor uh, 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 corresponds with the sighting that we, uh, that we had. And this is also interesting because it shows that we were flying over the Alps, just southern Germany, uh, around uh, uh, Austria. Mm -hmm. And it kind of shows how far the object is, is away from us. Um, looking at the red line the, on the track line on the uh, on the European map, yeah. so that also shows how much we can actually see from the cockpit. So this object, it was probably now what is it? Maybe two two and a half thousand kilometers away when it started to uh, uh, to deorbit, and it was clearly visible to all of us. In this case, I also contacted the um, uh, air traffic controller, asking if there was any military activity or anything going on. Um, he was not aware of any military activity, and he was just not not interested. And uh, it makes sense because the yeah. Uh, yeah the object was so high in the sky, and it was a the orbit of something that probably came in in the ocean just around uh, Spitsbergen or something. So it makes sense that the German air traffic controller was not aware of it. Yeah, that's amazing. It's still again, it's just another fascinating photograph, even having a prosaic explanation. So yeah, another great. Uh great case now one more i think of the uh of these and this is one that i think is quite important because it, these often get mistaken for ufos or anomalous things and this is starlink satellites so we've got a couple of images here so yeah if you want to talk us through them i mean what's that been like since they've become a thing in the sky is it is it something you have seen a, a lot of times yeah, many times, many times. Uh, the first time I saw them, uh, it was actually from my own back, back, uh, backyard. Uh, I, it's it's really fascinating to know that something is is so high up in the sky, uh, and it's it looks so uh, weird. So this this little yeah. train of lights. Um, then I saw them a couple of times from the air as well, and it's it's so easy to identify them as uh, uh, as man made and as or at least as as probably man made, and in this case also Starlink satellites. It's not only the little train of lights, which is uh, which is uh, typical for Starlink, uh, but also the speed uh, and the way they move. It's uh, it's typical for a man-made object in low Earth orbit. So let's say three or four hundred kilometers high. It's just like the ISS. It always moves at a constant speed. Uh, basically, because of orbital mechanics, you can calculate the speed per altitude. And the lowest low Earth stable orbit is around four. I, th I think three hundred fifty or four hundred fifty kilometers. Um, so you see on the speed and the really constant trajectory that it's a man-made object in low Earth orbit. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's a pretty common sight. And nowadays, actually, in general, uh, the satellites are, 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 are very common. Um, there are countless of satellites in the air. And Starlink is, is really one of the typical ones that really show up. Um, yeah, a couple of times people tell me, so oh, when you see something interesting from the air, it's just probably Starlink. 
I think now, well, <laughs> most most of the interesting stuff I've seen was in the beginning years of my career, long before SpaceX yeah. was even founded. And uh, for me, as a as a as a as a, as a pilot, um, um, I, I recognize the ISS. I know my satellites, and I, I I know Starlink. So it's I just included these pictures just to show that um, there are some really uh, mundane and and, and prosaic things as well, which are pretty cool as well, by the way, to see. Yeah, absolutely. Well, they're they're again fantastic great photographs those stars it's just the beauty of it all that that is a, a amazing to look at right then let's move on to this spain case because this is like you know one that you really sat, laid out in detail um and we've had it here behind us for the whole time with this very very small object that you can see here a little easter uh, egg <laughs> a little easter egg yeah uh, and i put out the photograph today on my on the little article that the sort of companion article i did alongside this interview um and yeah so let's bring up let's start i mean to, to everyone this is gonna just look like a normal sky and this is the first image that you took isn't it i can't even see yeah it's just uh literally the raw image as it came from the camera no editing nothing i mean that's Again, and yeah, when you zoom in, it's not obviously not that clear. It's so, so underwhelming. I'm the first to, the first to admit yeah. it's extremely <laughs> underwhelming. But uh, the context around it, it's it's making the image interesting. And yes, um, absolutely. Yeah. So this is the image. This is the the, the Spain image. Uh, let me see. This was January twenty third, two thousand ten. Um, I was still taking pictures with my uh, uh, Nikon D200, which is uh, almost a potato in comparison with my uh, present equipment. I just wished I had better equipment back then, but that's how it is. We were flying with a Boeing 737 from Amsterdam to uh, Malaga in the southern part of Spain. And uh, as you can see, it was just after sunset. Uh, the clouds, you can see actually on the, on the formation of the clouds, it's all layered. It's very stable weather. There's no thunderstorms. It's There's not a lot of vertical activity in the sky. There's no 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 uh, CBs or thunderstorms, or cumulus clouds, uh, you name it. Um, we entered the Spanish airspace, and the moment we uh, contacted Madrid uh, air, air Traffic Control, they control the upper air, uh, airspace in Spain, uh, the controller co cleared us direct to uh, position Crisa, which is uh, just north of uh, Malaga. So, in other words, uh, we were we were clear to leave the official airways and just continue in a direct line to the airport of Malaga, which uh, saves us time and fuel, and uh, that makes life much easier. Uh, that was also because we were the only airplane in the sky, more or less, especially in those altitudes, because uh, the airspace is cleared, as closed, sorry, uh, is empty. He could clear us direct to uh, to one of those points, and uh, everyone is happy. So uh, it was still about uh, 50 minutes of uh, flying left, if I'm not mistaken, 45, 50 minutes. And uh, we were already about 10 minutes direct course to Malaga when my co colleague, my captain, ex-Navy pilot, he suddenly asked me if I see the same little thing in the sky. So I I'm, started I'm to look outside and um, I saw this little dark object as well. And for about 10 minutes, we were really wondering what we were seeing because uh, we were flying at 41,000 feet, which is uh, even for commercial traffic uh, quite high. Yeah. Um, there are so there, there is commercial traffic that's flying higher than uh, than us. Uh, mostly small uh, business jets like Gulfstreams and uh, you, you name it. Uh, but most airliners, most uh, most passenger airliners, uh, they fly much lower. And the object we saw, as you can see, it's clearly above the horizon, and it's uh, uh, it's above us, pretty far above us, and it's uh, it's within the atmosphere. Objects that are outside of the atmosphere, um, they will reflect light. So um, let's say if you see another planet or you see the ISS or Starlink, um, they only show up because they reflect the light from either the moon or the sun. So they yeah. show up as a, as a bright spot. But if it's within our atmosphere, it will basically block the light. So you will see the shadow side of the object. And this object, as you can clearly see, it's within our atmosphere because you see the shadow side of it. Yeah. And it had a really weird shape. This is also the shape as I would see it with the naked eye. Mind you, I normally I wear glasses, so <laughs> maybe that's why it's a bit blurry. But uh, <laughs> this is this is this is the exact shape as we saw it with the naked eye. Um, so for almost fifty minutes, we were flying straight to Malaga, and this object was smack dead on 
far ahead of us, just directly um, in our in our line of sight. And uh, it didn't move. It didn't move uh, laterally, left or right of our track. It didn't seem to move towards us or far from it. It didn't move up and down. It was completely and absolutely stable. Um, and since we saw it exactly the same size, same shape and same position for almost one hour straight from uh, almost the northern part of Spain to uh, almost 20,000 feet in the descent into Malaga, um, it didn't change at all. So either it was pretty far ahead of us and it was just moving at the same speed, or it must have been a massive object, absolutely fucking massive, really, really, really far ahead of us. Right. So we were we were just contemplating about it and wondering, and I decided to ask the uh, the Spanish military, or sorry, the Spanish air traffic controller, uh, if there was any traffic ahead of us because uh, we've never seen such a strange strange airplane before, and he immediately told me uh, that no, we were the only one uh, as far as he knew in the airspace, forty thousand feet or above. And he was wondering what we saw. So I explained to him, we see this object, it's there already for 10 minutes and uh, seems to be a pretty big airplane ahead of us. And immediately, and this was really interesting, he immediately uh, asked me to contact the military air traffic controller, the Spanish military air traffic controller on a dedicated frequency. So my captain, he took over the radio, just a normal air traffic controller. And I took the second VHF radio and I got a dedicated frequency and I started calling the military air traffic controller. And uh, this guy was absolutely interested in what we saw. He was not dismissing it. He was he was not telling me, ah, oh, what you see is uh, a, a swamp gas or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> no, no he, was, he was absolutely interested in what we saw. Uh, so I explained it to him. And um, he confirmed to me that there was absolutely no civil or military um, um, traffic or objects in the sky, no weather balloons, absolutely nothing and he was uh, um, uh, he, he was really interested in what we saw and um, yeah that I, I've no clue if they did anything with it I never filed a report I have no clue what I what I could do or should do with something like this but what struck me is that we first of all we saw it for over an hour it uh, must mm. have been uh, ahead of us uh, high it didn't change any um, uh, uh, lateral or vertical uh, uh, how do you say this? It, 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 it didn't change its position from us at all. And uh, it must have been within our atmosphere. Plus, it was confirmed to me uh, by the military and the civil air traffic controller there was absolutely no traffic over Spain. So that leaves me wondering what it is. Um, I never took this picture uh, very serious, I must say. Um, I have it in my database, like all my pictures, and I... I was thinking about it every once in a while, just hoping to get a, an explanation for maybe a military test flight or anything funny. Um, yeah. Up to the, uh, as I said before, up to the uh, interviews uh, of uh, Commander David, David uh, Fravor and uh, later on uh, Mr. Elizondo. And um, I realized that there might be more to this picture uh, than I initially thought, especially because air traffic controller confirmed to us there was no traffic. Um, long story short, I've um, asked Mr. Tonio Cousin from um, Ipaco to analyze this image as well. And as we speak, the image is being analyzed and now um, analyzing also the clouds um, in, the, in the foreground uh, to try and get a, a distance, um, um, how do you say this, distance versus uh, size measurement on the right. object. Uh, it might take a while because um, uh, Mr. Cousin is, is very busy. He's also working for Gaipan, and they have a couple of really big cases they're working on. Um, by the way, he might be an interesting guest uh, for your uh, uh, show as well because uh, these guys are very down to earth and they, they make a living out of analyzing these images professionally. Um, but uh, yeah, he's, he's very interested in this image and he's now uh, processing it. And the moment the report comes out, I will, I will let you know and, and, yes, and see what it is. But yeah, I have no clue what it is. And this one, yeah, I bought a, an, an AI uh, image enhancer because uh, sometimes I have some really crappy pictures uh, taken with a potato that I want to enhance. And I decided to, um, to, to basically let the AI do its work on this object as well. So this is not the photo as it came out of the camera. This was just enhanced with a uh, digital uh, image enhancer. Right. I just let it run its automatic algorithm and it came up with this. So um, this is an image enhancement done by the computer based on AI. And uh, I'm not sure if it's, uh, if it's uh, uh, showing the actual object. Uh, and I've shown this, uh, this uh, 
uh, AI file to Mr. Cousin as well, and he was very interested in this uh, in this shape and, and size. Uh, it looks like a cigar shape um, with the rounded edges. That's also what we saw with the naked eye. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't look like a contrail. We would look uh, sometimes when there's an aircraft ahead of you. You look in the back of its contrail, and especially yeah. if it's a heavy airplane like a triple or a, a seven four. You see the typical um, two circles dissipating slowly. Uh, well, normally you see them for maybe two or three minutes if, if you fly behind them, and then they dissipate or they completely change because uh, the contrails constantly dissipate and, and grow depending on the on the air density and the. Not, the air density with the temperature and the um, uh, saturation of the air in this case it was stable and it doesn't look at all like a, like a control we're looking at so yeah, yeah. that's uh, that's the mystery we <laughs> uh, we have to uh, find a solution for right now and I'm I'm really looking forward to the final um, report from uh, from Ipaco to see what they come up with um, I would love to, to, to know what it is maybe it's um, Something military could be. It would be interesting because uh, um, even from an aeronautical perspective, it would be interesting to 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 see what kind of an airplane or or drone or whatever it is uh, might be uh, might be flying around there at those altitudes. And uh, maybe it's something else. I don't know. It would be interesting to uh, yeah. to see. Absolutely, and it, and like you said, it's just amazing that you know you got in touch with air traffic control immediately onto military air traffic control who took it seriously and confirmed that there was nothing military or civilian in the airspace so like you said it, it could be military and they could just be testing something top secret and they can't tell you that something there but it's i mean that's that causes an air safety question then doesn't it exactly and uh well that's also uh, good to keep in mind that um i think it's it would be so nice if more pilots start coming out with these kind of sightings because there's clearly an air safety aspect to it as well. Um, I Hopefully I've, I've been able to demonstrate that I'm not out here to to document the uh, uh, the unexpected or to uh, to make an interesting story out of something mundane. Um, I take pictures from the moon and the clouds all the time and I think with these kind of um, uh, sightings it shows uh, that it's important to, to, to keep a lookout for other things that are there and that we even uh, myself as a as a as a professional as a 747 captain uh trusted with the safety of my airplane i cannot explain and and uh, i think it's very important to to keep that aspect in mind um in general i think pilots most of the pilots are, are trained observers we know what we see uh, we have spent a lot of uh, time and money on our training and our the selection of our of, of our people um to do their job in the air so the, and as i said before the moment i see something the first thing that comes to mind is um is this going to be affecting the safety of my airplane is it uh, a weather phenomena is it uh, something military is it other traffic is it maybe even a, a weather balloon whatever it is uh, i, I want to know what it is so um yeah i think that's the first step to uh, to to identifying the problem and uh, um, actually, today on Twitter, I don't know who it was, but someone suggested to contact um, NARCA, was it? NARCA, that was it. And I, honestly, I never heard about that organization before. Uh, I looked it up just after dinner tonight and um, a very valuable suggestion. I'm going to contact them as well. Um, I'm probably going to contact them and uh, and see if they can analyze the, the photo over Spain as well. Um, because even though it's a very underwhelming photo with uh, with the rest of the, the context around it, um, I think it makes for an interesting analysis. And uh, um, yeah, you know, actually, I would also hope that a, an organization like uh, like NARCA would be more known to, to other pilots as well, because... Uh, as I said, a lot of my colleagues have come forward privately with some really interesting, uh, really, really interesting experiences. And uh, it would be nice if we would be able, even anon anonymously, but if, even be able to to have a, uh, have a place where we can just uh, report these things and, and, and make up a database maybe. Even though 99% of them are completely explainable and mundane, maybe that 1% will, uh, will make a difference. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and by all means, I'll, uh, you know, obviously we'll stay in touch and I'll, I have possibly a few avenues we can possibly get extra analysis done on the photograph because obviously the more eyes on it, looking at it, the better for, for an outcome, really. So we'll we'll discuss that. Off Absolutely. Here, but yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I, I mean, that was absolutely fascinating looking at, at 
in all of those cases, you know, even the, the the obvious prosaic ones, because it does just show what's out there, and and it, but it also shows your discernment and and the the detail that the the you require of yourself and the way you look at things. I think it's really important, and I hope. Uh, well, I can see from a lot of the comments I've been reading that people have been really interested in in everything that you've shown here today. So so I can't thank you enough for coming forward. It really does mean a lot. Yeah, well, that's that's, that's wonderful to hear, and. Uh um yeah I, I hopefully i've been able to to balance out the uh, uh the story because um it's easy to to jump to conclusions and say ah this this pilot just took a blurry picture and he's saying it's uh it's something uh, special no i i i i know what i'm seeing um and i think uh, i can identify 99 percent of the interesting stuff we see uh but it's 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 good to have an open discussion about it and to uh uh, let's see where the where the, where the where the chips may fall, and you know even even if it's just an, an on, a new anomalous uh, weather phenomena we would discover, maybe ball lightning or vertical lightning in clear skies. Even though it doesn't make sense to me right now, but uh, uh, neither do UAPs. I mean, there's there's something going on that I cannot explain, and if we can get some explanation for it, the better. So uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well. I guess that that we'll have to leave it there. A good hour and a half. Thank you, everyone, for the, for the wonderful questions, the donations, and uh, just taking the time out of your day to be here. As always, I really appreciate it. So yeah, um, for anybody that may be new here, uh, go and follow all of Christian stuff. That is in the description below. But also check out mine. My links are all in the description below. Um, I really appreciate anybody. Uh, and please, by all means, DM me. If you're a pilot, if you know a pilot or anyone in the military or anybody that has anything they want me to look at, I will always do my best to check it out. But for now, guys, yeah, I think that'll do it. We'll see you soon. Take care. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.